Hi, my name is David Waters, School Services Manager at Pearson. I'm currently in a slightly overcast Melbourne at uh, Pearson's uh, Mind Brain Education Conference. We've already had uh, a big day of learning and we've got a little bit more in store for you now. Um, I have the honour of being joined by our morning's keynote um, for a little bit of a Q&A session. Um, I'd like to welcome Greg Whitby, Executive Director of Catholic Education Diocese of Parramatta and Education Expert. Greg, thanks for joining us. Oh, not too much the expert, but it's great to be here. <laughs> I'm a fellow learner. <laughs> Um, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about what you were speaking today in your opening keynote? Oh, I think the, the fundamental approach that I was taking is the need to transform um, the, the way we go about the business of schooling. Uh, the current model has had its day and we've tried to improve it. It's led to a high cost, low reward. We're continually asking questions about how we can improve. We're compared with um, other countries and we're told that we're not up to the mark. So we come up with a whole range of strategies. You won't delay on that, you know, um, research on that, um, teacher wellbeing, teacher stress, high levels of stress for students. The current minister, federal ministers come out and call for you know, virtually more discipline in the classroom. So when are we going to stop doing the things that don't work and uh, turn it on, on its head and stop crafting and schooling the experience on an organisational model, an industrial model, but from a learning model? which would seem to be fit for purpose for the world in which we live. The one size fits all, this is how you get it packaged over this period of time. May have served its time when the world operated like that, but the world certainly doesn't operate like that at the moment. And I think that um, we're in a wonderful sort of interim period with a whole range of technological tools. It's not a technology issue um, per se, that we need those tools and we're changing the whole nature of the world in which we work and offering the kids the experience that are going to really engage them, that are going to teach them the skills that they need to, to operate in a world that's going to be continuously changing. And the one thing we know about that world is that the fu their future will be to learn how to do it because it's changing so rapidly. They're lucky that they'll get some of the tools we could only ever have dreamed of having um, and there to help them. So, the central idea was about transformation and sharing some of the examples that, you know, that are emerging and what can be done. Yeah, fantastic, and that's a, a very nice segue into the, to the next question. Um, rethinking the nature of um, learning and teaching has really been a mission of yours in your mm -hmm. uh, many years in education. Um, in that time, what evidence-based science, be it neuroscience, pedagogy, or psychology, um, do you believe has had the biggest impact? Um, I, I named three areas, I, I touched on them today. <coughs> Although sometimes they're largely ignored, I have to say, that we, over the last four decades, have come so far in our understanding about good learning and good teaching. And just the science of learning, um, we now understand quite clearly about how people learn, um, and there's a whole body of literature around that. Um, then the translation of how people learn into, into a, a schooling or a learning process, um, you know, that dreadful word pedagogy, but you know, um, there is so much we can do about that. And recently the focus on um, evidence-based, the emergence now of big data and a whole range of things have given us a very solid base on which to move forward. So the, the first two are around how people learn and the um, the issue of then the, the, the nature of that teaching and that. And um, we have a, a good, what I call a good canon, a, a good base, just like medicine has, law has, that we can refer to as touchstones. We know we're on safe ground in the directions we're heading. We're not just launching out and trying to reinvent something new. And the final one that's really exciting, and I, I know very little about, but I'm excited by it, is the whole understanding of the nature of the brain and neuroplasticity. The research that's been done there, um, I think is extraordinary. Um, and it helps, it doesn't change what um, we do in terms of learning theory and, and practice, but it becomes another lens that helps us to understand the depth um, of that and the complexity uh, in the, the learning environment. When you've got, um, people in constant contact and in, in relationship as you do in the teaching learning process. Those human issues that are going to come out in conflict, all those sorts of things, 
Sometimes we've dismissed and blamed the child that's gone wrong, well, he's got a tendon or he doesn't like me. And it, it's, a, it's a power thing, you know, because you know, the teacher's in charge. I think the neuroplasticity is telling you as well, no, that might be just a logical reaction and then the ways we can deal with that. So I think that's one of the really exciting ones. Underlying all that, of course, is the technology thing, but I, you know, I, I see that the technology issue and the space issue and how we design the schools are adjuncts. They're, they're tools to help us do the main thing. Enablers. Enablers, yeah. And we've got, we've got too used to them being used as the silver bullets, you know. We've had governments that put billions of dollars into buildings and billions of dollars into computers and nothing changed, as I said right at the beginning. So maybe it's time just to look at it a different way. That it's not the silver bullet in education. Imagine the investment in neuroplasticity and the way young people's brains function and working with teachers on that might be a, a better bang for your buck. Absolutely. And you've written a lot about the need for change in schools mm. um, and you've implemented a, a, a lot of what would seem quite radical um, mm. ideas around rethinking school hours, extending learning opportunities beyond the school gate, and you've trialled a few different learning environments. Um, how much do you think schools still need to change? And what do you, do you think schools will look anything like they do now in 10 years' time? Um, I, I like a question, but I, I don't like two words in it, radical and trial. Um, <laughs> We, we're not trialing anything. We're, we're doing the best, and I refer to what I said before about the theory and practice and the evidence. And based on that, I'm not interested in experimenting with young people's lives. That's, that's just um, nothing you know, we, we would do. Um, radical, well, if it's different, maybe that's radical. I like to think of it, it's just um, the next iteration. Um, and I'm not trying to be cute with words. When you start to use words like radical, people are like, oh, you know, and I am aware that some people sometimes think I've left the farm um, <laughs> in, in terms of the, the thinking. But um, we have been given the opportunity to, uh, we've got an extensive building program or need for provision of schooling because we serve uh, Western Sydney, fastest growing area in Australia. It'll double in size over the next um, 15 years, so we're, we're struggling to keep up with that need. And we made the determination that when we do this generation of schools that are fit for purpose, next generation, they should be the best we understand about learning. And that's taken this into a whole range of different models. We've moved away from the traditional constructs of K to six and seven to 12. We're talking about new ways of organisation where we're opening them for longer periods of times and having them more embedded in the community. And our most um, exciting one at the moment is being the, providing the schooling in the first science and technology park in Western Sydney. Now that's just not going to be a, a standalone building in the corner of the science tech park. It's going to be deeply embedded in the whole life of the, the um, community because we'll be able to tap into and work with research facilities. We've got the CSIRO, major universities, um, and uh, a whole lot of global research going on there. And it will have it as its focus this experiential model is learn an experiential model of learning driven by an inquiry cycle but focusing on STEM because it's in a science and tech park. So um, it's a great opportunity. Um, what it looks like we don't know yet. We're in the dialogue and discussion, but it's certainly not going to be like a standalone. So in that sense it's radical um, because people say it doesn't look like a school. Yep. Um, however, it's the school of the day that will equip us for Tomorrow. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the, to, to your point earlier, the, we do know you, there's the body of evidence and research mm -hmm. around how people learn and the best ways to get people mm -hmm. to learn. So in, in a sense, really, your teachers are the practitioners of, yeah. the, of that. It's, yeah. You're absolutely right. It's not, it's not about experimenting yeah. or trialling. Yeah. There's a good body of understanding of what does work. We have a, a mantra um, that we keep saying, you learn the work by doing the work and nobody can do the work for you. Yeah. And um, we all know that we have to learn the future. That, that's uh, the only way we'll do with the change is to learn how to cope with it. In, in much the same way, when motor cars were invented, you know, they had to learn how to, how to use them. It's just that it's on steroids now. Um, so that's the, the really hard, and that's the inquiry cycle. It's the research and that brings the rigor into the process. Fantastic. And uh, just uh, one closing question. Um, I, I know uh, everyone has got a. a fantastic memory of, of their favourite teacher or a really impactful teacher. 
Um, do you mind sharing a, a, a story of a teacher that's had a big impact on your life? I, uh, yeah, I was a colleague, no, you know, I, have, I have several from uh, still my, uh, my history teacher at school was uh, Brother Conrad was outstanding. But in terms of you know, learning, I, when I first started teaching, I worked with a, a guy named John Reed, who's unfortunately passed away too young with cancer. And um, he was an absolute renegade in a very contrived system. And, uh, he was always in, in strife with the hierarchy of the school. The kids absolutely worshipped him because he he start, he knew where they were at. And you know, he, he was of their world. He was into music of that time before it was popular to to do all those sort of things days before we even had Walkmans. But um, he was absolutely extraordinary. You could see there were no problems in his class and the, the, the kids were just so totally um, on board with him because they knew his deep concern. And he he would start from um, their base. I always remember one particular first time he said where he was having trouble with um, the assessment program and uh, kids, you know, um, being prepared to get sort of you know, mark out of a hundred. So he bought in a scale and he said, what I've done in my class, I've got a scale of one to a hundred thousand. So, so what happened? A, a child would get 40,000 out of one hundred thousand. Yeah. <laughs> 40, he changed the dynamic yeah. immediately. Yeah. So these kids were all, I give one out of ten, they got four out of ten, I think the same, it's 40,000. <laughs> so it, it was some very simple things like that. So. He's always just been there in the background. Oh, fantastic. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it and looking forward to seeing what dates you bring to, to my brand education. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks very much.